My name is Chiara Bonacchi and I work at the UCL Institute of Archaeology, so University College London. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thank Daniel and his brilliant team and um, the Museo Archeologico for having us um, here today to talk about our collaborative British Museum, University College London crowdsourcing project, Microtasks. Um, in the last few years, crowdsourcing has been um, recently um, increasingly uh, used uh, and explored as a method to um, really support the collaborative uh, management, uh, preservation and interpretation of different kinds uh, of heritage resources. And uh, initiatives have really fallen mainly uh, into two categories. So um, there are initiatives that have really focused uh, on the crowdsourcing of collections belonging to one uh, institution, and we've seen uh, the great example of Blue Crowds. And other initiatives like Microtasks um, have instead focused on trying to enable the crowdsourcing of collections and data that come from different uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And to our knowledge, Microtasks uh, has really been the first crowdsourcing platform focusing on archaeology specifically. Microtasks was set up in 2013 uh, as a collaboration, as I was mentioning, between uh, the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, and the British Museum. And it was funded by um, uh, the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, which is really the main public funder uh, for arts and humanities research projects uh, in the UK. The aim of Microtasks has really been that of supporting um, developing collaborations between uh, universities, museums, archives on the one end, and members of the public on the other in order to conduct research into the human past together. And um, to do so uh, in three main ways, really. The main component of Microtasks um, has been crowdsourcing. So co-producing, producing together, uh, research quality data in archaeology, history, and heritage via crowdsourcing. Then we've also experimented a little bit with crowdfunding, uh, so how we could use crowdfunding um, and the crowdfunding platform to microfinance community archaeology and community uh, history uh, projects. So projects developed essentially by mixed teams uh, involving both researchers based in uh, museums or universities and, um, for example, local communities or archaeological societies. Uh, and finally, we've been using forum technologies in order to really discuss how um, research data could be used um, and uh, is used uh, by us. Um, so data that has been, the, the use, the value of um, data that has been crowdsourced for archaeological research. The project started in 2013, um, and after about six months of development, we could actually launch uh, the crowdsourcing website, um, which you see here, crowdsource.microtasks.org, and uh, the community forum. And um, our development work uh, really um, was a collaboration with Daniel, with Paibosta, um, as regards, uh, of course, the, the um, crowdsourcing platform, which relies on open source software uh, and on the PyBossa, uh, the framework developed by PyBossa. But then progressively, we've been trying to develop and deploy crowdsourcing applications in-house. So we've tried to skill up um, our team so that we could uh, manage uh, the process from a technical point of view in-house using um, GitHub for version control. On the crowdsourcing um, website, Micropasts, members of the public can participate in a number of different um, applications to create um, different kinds of data. And um, in the majority of the case, in the majority of cases, um, these are um, 
applications that are useful to create uh, data for which um, a specific research use is anticipated up front. The applications are modular, uh, so this means that, for example, even if they have been uh, developed in order to uh, support the transcription of a certain archive of object cards, with minor adaptations, they can be used um, also for the transcription of cards from a different archive. And this is key, um, of course, in order to make uh, the process uh, sustainable um, and cost-effective, um, obviously, across uh, different institutions. One um, application that we've been deploying uh, quite a bit um, is the one that you see here for the transcription and georeferencing of a very large, um, well, not as large now I feel compared to <laughs> <laughs> what was presented by Nora, but uh, archaeologically speaking, a very large <laughs> archive of um, about 30,000 um, object cards that document uh, metal finds that were retrieved um, in Britain in the 19th and, um, and 20th uh, centuries. Um, the National Bronze Age um, Internet Index, and Jennifer will talk about these case studies um, in, in uh, further detail. Another application was um, developed in order to uh, ultimately um, 3D print uh, these, um, for example, um, small um, flange dactyls and other um, objects. Um, this is a new application uh, we created and we call it 3D photo masking. So the point is really to ask um, for help to um, draw the outlines of artifacts on sets of photos that have been taken all around the artifacts so that um, the mask uh, the mass photos can be used offline in order to create, um, again, research quality 3D models um, of the artifacts. Uh, we've al we also had other applications, for example, for the public indexing of um, archival material um, via tagging. Um, so, for instance, um, historical photographs. Um, or, uh, for example, applications that used um, uh, tagging uh, in order to test vocabularies for the description of um, artifacts, as in the case of Project Andvari, so the description of um, early uh, medieval artifacts um, in Northern Europe, which um, were housed in different collections. So we, here we have also an aspect of open and linked uh, data, so linking up data that actually um, is geographically dispersed. Our validation process um, was really very much based on redundancy. Uh, so we would have two to four, uh, depending on the application, volunteers um, completing um, the same task, so the same transcription task, so the same masking task. Um, and then, for example, in the case of transcription, there would be first the more experienced collaborator um, looking through the data um, and suggesting a valid answer and then um, on the British Museum and um, work was done to consolidate um, the data and just um, finalize it. Uh, in the case of the masking, instead we've been really picking the best mask. We've, we've tried several uh, pathways and ways of doing this, but in the end we found that the most cost effective was picking the best mask um, and just using that for the modeling offline. Um, as we were going along, um, we were also making, making our data uh, available. So um, all the data that um, has been used uh, by microtasks or created by microtasks um, is available via the Microtask Data Center, which is a dedicated web page. And here you find data at diff three different stages. Raw data, so um, the scans of the cards, um, the photos of the artifacts, um, crowdsourced data which has not been finalized yet, um, and the finalized uh, consolidated version. How have we been um, fostering participation? The key um, has really been starting with a, a contributory model uh, of participation where people were contributing and participating via the submission of rather mechanical tasks. But 
um, what we found was that after about three, four months, uh, the most involved collaborators were starting to drop out because those who are very involved after a while feel that submitting rather mechanical tasks is quite not enough for them anymore. So we were very responsive um, in this process and to sustain participation for a time, we uh, decided to go a step further and, um, and really uh, enable uh, more uh, deeper uh, ways of participating, uh, more co-creative, and I will explain how, and collaborative. At the contributory level, um, so uh, when it comes to submitting um, rather mechanical tasks, we've been working with more than 1,200 um, registered contributors plus um, more uh, anonymous contributors. As you can see here, um, it was really quite a few people who could be um, accounted for the majority of the work that was done. You see these are two um, rank size uh, plots that show the ranking of users based on the number of tasks that submitted for transcription and for photo mounting. Um, so really it shows quite a few people did a lot of the tasks um, that were submittable. Um, and here I should also say that um, something that um, uh, I've been focusing on on the project this uh, particularly was the study of participants' behavior, uh, motivations, and profile. Uh, so as, in, as soon as MicroPass launch, launched, <laughs> there was also a, um, a research program that launched at the same time looking into uh, participant profiles, behavior, and motivation. And this was quite important for us to, um, along the way, uh, in order to be responsive and to really understand uh, the process uh, that we were creating and progressively adapting. Um, something that um, it was possible to see um, is also that the photo masking, uh, so the part relating to the 3D modeling, was slightly more democratizing. So um, participation, um, the distribution of participation was slightly less skewed. Uh, and also um, the photo masking, uh, so image-based, uh, tended to attract, uh, tended to attract uh, a higher number of younger audiences, which of course for museums, particularly in the UK right now, is um, often a core uh, aim, so to bring in the younger, young people, um, the, the 1624 segment. Um, at a co-creative level, we've been working with about 100 uh, of the people who were submitting tasks, and we've been inviting them to, um, well, we've been inviting all participants, but 100 of them uh, actually stepped in. Um, and we've been discussing with them um, through the forum, through social media, and through personal emails, because um, we found that some people just prefer the direct contact. Um, ways of bringing micropasts forward, but also bringing um, the, the barriers, um, the, the, the participation forward. Uh, so we really literally asked what periods they would be more interested in um, uh, working with or collections and what other activities beyond uh, the, the, the crowdsourcing, the submission of mechanical tasks they would be uh, interested in, in being involved in, or what incentives they would have liked. Now, mugs were popular, but we didn't quite have the budget. So we responded uh, to other kinds of suggestions, um, which were very interesting. Um, and um, what we found was that quite a few of the very involved collaborators really wanted to do something more than, as I was saying, submitting tasks. They wanted to be involved with um, activities that are a little bit more at the interface between the creation and the interpretation of the data. So for example, um, they wanted to be trusted to um, do the have a first go at consolidating the data, um, and they wanted to, start to learn essentially how to create the 3D models using the mask that they themselves had created. And this is what we enabled, so we responded to that. Through the forum, we did training, um, uh, on the 3D modeling aspect um, and also individual um, training on the transcription. And throughout, on top of this, we've been um, supporting participation via a number of resources, a research blog, um, 
uh, but also a dedicated page um, of learning resources where uh, we made available information about the periods and the collections um, we were working with, but also the methods that we were uh, engaging with from 3D modeling to crowdsourcing itself. And um, our original aim was really to try and engage two main audiences, um, to tap into existing uh, communities um, established offline, uh, archaeological and historical societies, um, uh, and also uh, various groups of friends, for example, um, linked to the British Museum. But also, um, we wanted to engage um, an online and unknown crowd of people distributed um, all around the world and potentially interested, we could guess, in the digital technologies uh, aspect or um, with a general interest about the past um, or in data management, for example. Um, and to engage the first group, um, we did um, quite a lot of personal um, tailored emailing, posting on certain web pages, um, sorry, um, uh, social media pages, um, uh, and so on. And to engage the second group, instead we did, um, we tried to do as much as possible with our <laughs> very small budget, in fact, um, for this. Um, but we tried to do as much as possible um, uh, of uh, online publicity, as we could. And in fact, what really brought us people, uh, and, and this is quite consolidated across uh, crowdsourcing projects, is you know the the news uh, the, the newspaper uh, article that comes um, comes out on the national press. That's like a peak uh, immediately. So um, paradoxically, um, to involve people in these newer technologies, uh, relying on the older media, is um, potentially um, the best strategy to just attract new uh, new people. Um, and because we had surveys scheduled to appear after one in 25 tasks submitted, we also know that uh, we've been working with um, three quarters of contributors who do not work with archaeology or history as part of the main job, the job they do for a living. This doesn't mean that they haven't studied the subject, it doesn't mean they um, are not passionate about it, but they don't work with it professionally. So we could actually, there is evidence of reaching out uh, the walls of the museum, reaching out the walls of um, archives and, um, and the universities, <laughs> of course. And something that is also really interesting um, to me is the fact that even though Microcast um, is in English, basically, with little translation here and there that we do um, in relation to specific applications, we've had um, involved contributors also coming from Greece, uh, France um, and, uh, for example, uh, Italy. Um, and this has been because we've had a number of applications um, that revolved around digital images. Um, the photomasking one with the 3D modeling, um, another one, um, in fact, developed by OG on tagging, um, image tagging. Um, and this has been key to engage an audience that is quite spread geographically and potentially not very um, uh, fluent, uh, if you like, in English, but interested, for example, in photography. Um, motivations, so what, what leads people to actually do this <laughs> in the first place? Um, there are three uh, main groups of motivations. A group um, is really shared across, um, can record also um, uh, in relation to um, in-person visitation of museums, for example. So uh, they participate because they want to have a learning or training opportunity for themselves or their family and friends. For example, they want their children to be engaged. Um, they want to just relax and have some sort of gaming experience. Um, so photo masking, for example, uh, uh, paralleled by one contributor to Candy Crush or something like that. Um, but also for the aesthetic pleasure um, of looking at the cards, the calligraphy uh, of the curators that um, wrote them um, uh, in past centuries, or um, looking up, uh, the aesthetic pleasure of looking up um, 
being able to look up the, um, the materials, the, uh, the objects, um, very closely. Um, and there was an aspect of uh, materiality uh, that was mentioned uh, by, for example, a few of the contributors that we've been talking with. Uh, so even though this all exists in the digital um, space, nonetheless, uh, there is a, a passion for actually exploring um, the object um, close up. A second group of motivations can be found across various crowdsourcing projects. So there are the social motivations of helping out, uh, giving back to an institution uh, that some of these visitors, uh, some of these contributors had visited in the past. For example, um, so an Australian contributor had visited the British Museum, so the possibility uh, of being engaged um, uh, while he was actually reading uh, an article. Um, an article uh, on a um, major newspaper in her country and thought, well, I just want to give something back to these institutions. I went in for free, it was such a great experience. I want to help out. Or um, making valuable use of their own knowledge and skills and advancing scientific knowledge. Competition is also a component, but only in, in like very few cases. This became sort of out of control and needed to be managed, um, which we ended up uh, being able to without actually uh, blocking anyone because Paibosa wouldn't allow you to. Um, <laughs> and the third um, group of motivations um, is I think uh, perhaps right now uh, it feels um, something that uh, the humanities even more than the science domain. So some of these participants mentioned the fact that they, for them it was a way of reconnecting with um, a subject that they had studied, for example, at university, but for different reasons related to life, could not make a, a career out of. And it was a way to go, to go back to it uh, in their own time when they could actually do it. <coughs> so, um, just to um, conclude this overview before uh, passing on to Jen, um, what is the value or what has been the value of um, being involved in archaeological crowdsourcing? Um, for people, and by people I mean the team, <laughs> for us, uh, as well as uh, the collaborators, uh, there's been huge skilling up, um, also from a technical point of view. There's been an exchange. Our team ha was made up of people um, who were like Bronze Age specialists um, or more on the computational side um, of archaeology or more on the social side uh, of the uh, analysis and looking at um, participation in archaeology. And we've been really um, interacting with each other and exchanging knowledge around it. And, and perhaps this means uh, just um, uh, we found, well, we found that actually contributed to uh, our skilling up. And of course, Daniel was very useful <laughs> and helpful for the, skill, the technical skilling up. Um, knowledge um, was gained and consolidated, and these are all things that have been mentioned by uh, our collaborators as results of their engagement. The possibility of getting recognition publicly uh, for their work and their skills, the skills they had gained. So for example, via social media, they're all acknowledged um, their names all appear on the crowdsourcing uh, applications that are completed on metadata, um, uh, on Sketchfab where the 3D models are uploaded. We mention their names sometimes in research blogs um, as much as we can. Uh, employment, of course. Uh, in one case, um, employment uh, as a result of the skilling up of the recognition, the possibility to go back to the subject this person will had studied um, and being able to improve her CV, then a job, finding the subject she wanted to work with, um, data management um, in the heritage sector came up. And connectedness. So the possibility of having um, a group uh, of people online uh, with whom to discuss different, um, essentially, niche interests like uh, 3D modeling. And here I should mention that the group of Micropaths collaborator exists primarily online. Some of them, uh, those, but first of all, it's very geographically dispersed. So Canada, Australia, and it's, uh, I mean, trying to organize a session on the forum to review the work that had been done 
um, I thought it would take a couple of days with the time zones. It took like two weeks <laughs> with lots and lots and lots of um, contributions, but it was very delayed. Uh, so what I was saying is that there is a crowd, sorry, it's, a, it's an online group. The majority of these people um, are not connected with each other. They're more connected with the institutions. But within this group, there is a more interconnected group of people which bonded when we were doing, for example, the training on the 3D modeling aspect and when we were doing, uh, when we were reviewing their work. Um, value for heritage, um, well, we developed um, new applications that are modular and can be used for different collections. Um, we have 150 completed applications, more than 100 um, 3D models uh, done. I'll let Jen speak about the amazing work in the National Bronze Age Instrument Index. Um, and innovation, uh, we think of a process um, because um, now a new grant uh, has been approved and I was telling Daniel earlier. Uh, so the, the UK um, Arts and Humanities Research Council gave further money for a project um, that will look at the contemporary heritage of Iron Age, Roman and early medieval pasts in Britain. And micropasts was written in um, as a, and crowdsourcing as one of the research methods. So uh, to do the content analysis, um, we will um, use a little bit of crowdsourcing involving people in um, analyzing um, uh, various kinds uh, of data. So there has been also recognition uh, of the method for, from a, a public, the, the main public um, funder for research in the UK. Now I'll let Jen talk about uh, 